Coming up on Nebraska Stories, America's storyteller shares his quilts. A look back at the life of General John J. Pershing, Nebraska's largest garage sale, and a rising star in Hollywood. The shipment arriving today at the International Quilt Study Center and Museum began its long journey one year ago in a small New England town at a place called Quilt Alley. Okay, so this, just put on sunglasses. This is like being at the first atomic explosion. Where did these come from? Was this the 1960s? You know, was this a psychedelic poster or something? <laughs> no, this is the 1830s, an Amish community. Amazing to me, amazing. In the lower level of his barn, filmmaker Ken Burns guides two Quilt Museum staff members, executive director Leslie Levy and curator Carolyn Ducey, through his private collection. Burns has agreed to publicly exhibit his quilts for the first time. I have never displayed my quilt any other place but in a place where I live. So it's, it's been, there's a few things that I do in my life that are just for me. As the tour weaves through the many rooms, here's another spectacular applique. A story of Ken Burns, the collector, unfolds. We kind of wanted to get a feel for why he was collecting. What did quilts mean to him? Here's this man who's a historian that could be collecting anything, and he's recognized quilts and, and the the visceral appeal of them. This might eat you. <laughs> this uh, is great. How great is this? The precision and the beauty of the applique. This is red, white, and blue that happen to be colors similar to our flag, but the blue is not the blue. And I'm a blue guy who is very blue about the fact that this isn't the right <laughs> blue. Again, they haven't sure. quite figured out the blue, and they're getting closer to the correct blue. And I, I, <laughs> this to me, this, I mean, there's something in me that goes, and then there's something incredibly poignant and beautiful that the flag exists in a sea of crosses. I was like, I, I literally, I was scrambling notes thinking, he can speak about quilts in the most elegant way and, and talk about them in the way that they tie into his love of history, his love of America, his love of just the ordinary people and, and what they created and what they went through you really started to see how all those quilts reflected those things that you see in, in his love of documenting American history. This is more of a historical quilt. This is oh, the is NRA, fabulous. meaning the National Recovery FDR. Administration, yeah. and its symbol was the Blue Eagle. It's fabulous. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful quilt. His quilts are something that he truly loves and truly lives with. Okay, speaking of hidden away, quilts, more quilts. Not room, quilts, hidden. Love it. They shouldn't be hidden, right? It was fun to see how much he loves them and how he wants to have them out and be surrounded by them. And then to hear him just say, oh, and, and I do this, I have to, anybody who loves quilts and collects is like, oh, this is my favorite. Oh, this is my favorite. You know, I, I can't decide which is my favorite. Now this oh, is one of my favorite oh, quilts. Sweet. It's one of the earliest so appliques I've ever bought. It just yells at me. This is one of my favorites as well. I guess I would have to say if I had to name a favorite and I can't do that, it would be this quilt because I was not aware that Ken Burns was a quilt collector. And we really yeah. discovered that because of our uh, executive director, Leslie's Levy's former position at the Cather Foundation, where she had gotten to know Ken as one of their board members. And he was excited to hear that she was moving to the museum and mentioned, hey, yeah, I collect quilts and I have for a number of years. And she said, I'm tucking that away for later, Ken. He knew the museum and had respect for the organization and the program. 
We're renowned for our exhibitions and our collection. So I think, too, it was a matter that we, the timing was probably just right. I suspect that yes. Ken is just at that time in his life when he is willing to share. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, look at that log cabin. The common sharing of our, our heritage becomes a way in which you can continue to have a civil discourse. And that's really, really important to me. And quilts and films are ways to do that. And that, that's been my mission in life. So I'm, I'm very excited by the possibility of sharing these and r reminding people that somebody from a tiny little state in the upper right-hand corner of their country, rather than this gigantic state in the middle of our country, um, share a lot in common. I have to say what I'm drawn to most in the collection are the red, white, and blue quilts. And I think that's because I think of Ken as such an American storyteller. It's now eight months later, and the museum staff is reviewing photographs of Ken Burns' quilts. From these photos, they will select the ones to display in the exhibit. And this piece, oh my god, yeah, this is such a rare piece. To have one of these yeah. is just an amazing thing. Temperance, Temperance definitely love this. I, I like that. This. It really would work well with a lot of our red, white, and blue. And the exhibit team meets to discuss design concepts. This is just a mock-up of a concept of spanning the corner of the gallery here, and then we could suspend these quilts, uh, and they could actually overlap each other. Three months before the exhibit opens, the quilts are packed and shipped to the museum. On arrival, they're placed in isolation for two weeks. While in isolation, each quilt is examined to note any condition issues. Here's a little staining right here. Finally, the moment the staff has most looked forward to has arrived, object review. It's here decisions are made on how to exhibit each quilt. Incredibly damaged, definitely can't hang. I'd sure rather see it flat. And it's really an extremely important quilt because you just don't see temperance quilts. They consider size, color, design and texture, and also how the quilts are grouped for the exhibit. In total, they review 33 quilts. I've spent my entire professional life asking this essentially simple question, who are we? Who are those strange and complicated people who like to call themselves Americans? And all of my films are attempting not so much to answer that question, but to deepen it. So as an avocation, as a hobby, I have pursued collecting what I think is the is the cleanest, simplest, and, and most authentic expression of who we are as a people. Two weeks before the open, the staff begins building the exhibit. Great. By opening day, the museum's exhibit, Uncovered, the Ken Burns Collection, has already attracted national attention. I can easily see why he was attracted to that. Interesting color and texture. I just really love those colors. I can see why he picks them from the heart. <laughs> and the color, oh my goodness. Uh -huh. Oddly enough, 
the man known as America's storyteller, who gets into the weeds and doesn't shy away from complexity in his documentaries, doesn't need to know the same about his quilts. It's not so much that I am interested in investing myself with every bit of minutia about this quilt. More often than not, the way I've gotten it is by stopping along the roadside at an antiques place and finding buried underneath a pile of other things some beautiful gem, and it's very difficult to track down the precise provenance of that quilt. So what you're left with is the mystery as well as the beauty of it. And that, to me, is, is what it's about. There's something incredibly human and incredibly authentic about that. And um, it means that Ken Burns is just like us. <laughs> and isn't that nice? I think, quite frankly, from my perspective and as the director of this museum, that's one of the things that I love and respect is that he would say that, that it's OK. I don't need to know the specifics to love it. I just love it for what it is on the face of it. I just love it. A century ago, World War I raged in Europe. Historians say the war made the U.S. a global superpower. General John J. Pershing, a man with strong Nebraska ties, commanded the U.S. troops that helped to end the bloody fighting. Over there, over there. November 11th, 1918, America and the world celebrated an end to World War I. 3,000 miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Four years of fighting claimed millions of lives before U.S. troops, led by General John J. Pershing, arrived in France. They were called the American Expeditionary Forces and joined the French and British to turn the battle tide against the German military. In 18 months, General Pershing helped to transform 220,000 U.S. troops into a fighting force of 4 million. He should be thought of as a quintessential American man. Right place, right time. General Pershing became the only acting six-star general in U.S. history. Today, though, his name is recognized by few people, even in Nebraska, where an important part of Pershing's life unfolded. In 1891, the 31-year-old Pershing thought seriously about leaving the Army after four years in the 6th Cavalry. He had commanded frontier outposts in the Indian War, and there seemed to be few promotional opportunities left for First Lieutenant Pershing. So after times you know, chasing Native Americans in Arizona and other places, uh, he does get a chance to take a break. Pershing's break was a transfer to the University of Nebraska. Here in Lincoln, he has a sense of having arrived. Pershing taught military science at the University of Nebraska and began work on a law degree. Most importantly, Pershing took charge of the school's failing military training program and its 100 cadets. Underrated, secondhand, nobody gave two hoots about the program. Under Pershing's command, McNeese says things quickly changed. Pershing instilled something in his cadets that they hadn't had before. It was discipline. Better button up that coat, you better get, why are your shoes not polished? And all these farm boys are kind of, wait, 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 who's, who's this guy and why, what, what, what? Within a year, 350 students joined Pershing's UNL Cadet Corps. And by 1892, Pershing's cadets were ready to be tested in a national military drill competition. UNL's elite cadet squad competed in Omaha against veteran teams from across the country. When it was announced that Pershing's UNL cadets had won their division, hundreds of UNL students and faculty climbed over the fence and charged the parade field to celebrate. And they were led by UNL Chancellor James Canfield. 
He's well, even the chancellor small. of the of the university, <laughs> right. yeah, Chancellor yeah. Canfield, is, right. is, who is not a, not a small man, is is climbing over this eight foot tall fence. In 1895, Pershing's time at UNL came to an end. In honor of their recently departed lieutenant, UNL's elite drill team renamed itself Pershing's Rifles. Today, units like them across the country are known as the National Society of Pershing Rifles. In the decades that followed, Pershing commanded U.S. troops in the Spanish-American War. In the Philippines, he was promoted to the rank of one-star general. Now married with a wife and four children, Pershing's life seemed complete until tragedy struck in 1915. Pershing's wife, Frankie, and their three young daughters died in a San Francisco fire. The fire's only survivor was Pershing's five-year-old son, Warren. Pershing privately poured his crushing sorrow into the command of 10,000 U.S. troops sent to hunt Mexican Revolutionary General Francisco Pancho Villa. Pershing's son, Warren, now the most important person in the general's life, lived in Lincoln, Nebraska with Pershing's two sisters. October 31, 1916. My dear little boy. Recently, Pershing's granddaughter-in-law read a 1916 letter the general wrote from Mexico to his son in Lincoln. This small red flag with one white star in the center is the flag that has been in front of your papa's tent for several months. As I now must have two stars in my flag, I am sending you this one to keep as a souvenir. With it goes all the love of my soul. May God keep you and help you to be a good and great man. A year later, Pershing would command American troops in World War I. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. America's sacrifices in the Great War were enormous. More than 323,000 U.S. troops died, were wounded, or went missing. America's victory, though, gave the U.S. global recognition as a leader of the free world and a superpower with a modern military. A turning point in John Pershing's long journey that once led through Nebraska. But if you look at the army that Pershing left behind, it has been turned into a modern force, the large standing army. Pershing wasn't the only architect of that, but he was the most important person to execute that, that transformation. Well, it's kind of like Nebraska football. You certainly wouldn't plan a wedding on Junk Junk Weekend. Huh? No, no. This is, uh, this is this very is, important. Mm -hmm. This is almost like a, well, it is a national holiday We call it me. our national yeah. holiday. True. We wait all year for the Junk Junk. We didn't do the very first year of the Junk Junk. Somehow we missed that, and then... I think I told you guys we about it. We talked about it on a Friday night, and we decided and we that we decided were going to go. We decided to go, and we loaded up, and we had a ball. We left Grand Island at, like, it seemed like 4.30 in the morning. It might have been, and we... First stop we was in Coatesfield. We decided we yeah. were going to get all the way up to somewhere, I can't remember, but we Burwell. stopped probably 40 times before we got there. Yeah, we did make you it see the Burwell. orange signs, those neon orange signs, and your heart starts to palpitate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I... I think with the competition, it started with uh, good friends of ours, a mother and two daughters. Uh, they found out that we needed places to stay on the junk chunt, and they offered their cabin to us. And uh, we Up would buy them, City. yeah, at Sherman, and we would buy them goofy gifts. So we would, sh you know, during our shopping, we would find things that were absolutely ridiculous or funny. The poodle and, that would follow you across the room. Right. Different <laughs> gifts. And uh, every year they got really excited and then they'd buy us gifts too. And uh -huh. the, uh, we got, our, got to talking and came up with the idea of a scavenger hunt and having a neutral party that, do, that knew both teams. Uh, come up with a pretty crazy list of oddities to find. Including the Punky Brewster memorabilia, which we never yes. ever found. Yeah, Punky has a middle name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's not nice. 
And it's not <laughs> Anne no. or Joe. No. <laughs> One of the rules that we developed, we uh, started to meet in Carroll at noon. The, the list is released to us, brought down the list. We go over the rules, so there's, uh, you know. We narrow it down to a certain amount. Yeah. Start and out and we cut morning. out the things that we know we won't be able to find because we're seasoned junk jaunters. Right. Uh, there's a lot of cussing and discussing over the list a little bit between mm -hmm. the two teams. Um, it gets heated. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, the I couch. still think the couch was a good deal. Yeah, yeah. The, couch was in, the, couch the couch was from the old Sears catalog too, wasn't it, was, it? Yep. After I tore it apart to fix it up, um, all the paperwork was underneath of it. It was shipped from Sears in Chicago by rail to Danabrog, Nebraska in 1910. Um, and I had done. somebody refinish or recover it for me. But that was a heck of a deal you got. Yeah, I bought it for 50 bucks and I had it evaluated for insurance purposes. And um, we'll just say it was worth several thousand dollars. This part of the country on the junction is so beautiful and the people oh. are so nice. You I really think you're missing out on Nebraska if you don't get up in that area and meet in those the people sand hills and see all that. The, in, the, in the North Loop area, it's very, very, oh, very pretty. Oh, it's gorgeous up beautiful. there. Yeah. We so, drove back yesterday along the Loop River and it was just awesome. The trees were starting to turn and the river just winds through there and there's a big there's big hills on this side and and there's a couple wineries there. Yeah, there's are, some wineries. Not only wineries, but there's breweries we're now. Flying, there's we're, brew pubs. We're going to yeah, look it up. Look, I'm excited up about all that. the new brew pubs. Yeah, so. we're flying by the seat of our pants, so to speak. We've met people from Florida, Washington, Alberta, Canada. We've met people from California. Mm -hmm. Some people have sign-in books. Please put where yes. you're from. Mm -hmm. We always put Nova Scotia. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes. I've signed in as Patsy Klein. But <laughs> And Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usually the last weekend in September is the in Nebraska is the place to be. Many children grow up going to the movies. Some even imagine being in them. For a select few, that dream actually happens. She's always been interested in, you know, kind of dressing up, princess play, that kind of stuff when she was little. By the time she was like five-ish, you know, she would watch a lot of television, watch a lot of movies and stuff, and when she turned six, she was like, Mom, I want to do that. Eva Bella is a child actress originally from Omaha. Of the five films nominated for Best Animated Feature at the 2014 Academy Awards, Eva lent her voice to three of them, including Disney's Frozen. I had the chance to talk with Eva while she was back in Nebraska. Frozen has meant everything to me, basically. It, it just, it's an amazing movie. I think the movie's really touched everybody. It's just so amazing to me. None of us knew that it would be like this big. We thought, oh, it's just gonna be, you know, a Disney movie. And it's responded so amazingly to other people that that's the best part about it. Okay, Anna, I got you. Elsa, what have you done? This is With her main claim to fame, the role of young Elsa in Frozen, Eva is continuing to grow as an actress. It's really fun, like, when you get a script, you get to be the person. And, because normally, when you're yourself, you're yourself and you have your own personality. But you get to, like, feel someone else's personality and feelings through a script, which is, which is what I think is the coolest part. The thing with voiceover is that, in, I mean, first off, animation's really cool and you always get to see it before they're people, which is awesome, and it's just fun feeling the character just through your voice without showing any, like, face emotions or anything else. You just get to use your voice. And the funny thing is, we always, Eva goes into my closet, our bedroom closet, she takes my phone with her, she records the lines, and then we just forward that on to her agent. So she's actually booked a lot of jobs from recording herself in our bedroom closet, which is kind of funny. 
it hasn't been all smooth sailing in attempting to start a young acting career. That first year, Eva's father and brother stayed behind. Keeping that family connection from a distance was a struggle. It was really difficult, particularly, you know, Tim didn't have a lot of support. Um, my sister Jessica was living in Pittsburgh at the time, and she would literally drive in, spend the week with Max, and then go, you know drive another five to six hours to help Tim during the week with Max. I mean, Max turned 10, and I was in LA, and he was in Indiana at the time. You know, and we're Skyping, and having Skype sessions with your 10-year-old on his birthday, I mean, that's heartbreaking. So it was definitely a lot of sacrifice. With the family reunited, the sacrifices have paid off, and Eva is ambitious about her future. I want to be a director, and I want to be an entertainment lawyer. What about producing? What about giving an interview? Is that something that you maybe want to try? Yeah. Get up and switch me seats. Awesome. All right, you can ask me whatever you want. Okay. Do you like your job? I love my job. What's your favorite part of your job? The, my favorite part of my job is being able to create a story and being able to interview people like you and being able to build it from the initial idea to the final product. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I think that's what you'll like about being a director. It was a great interview. Thanks for having me here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right, good. Avenir is awesome. You know, you get so many no's in Hollywood, and you get one, ch one yes, and it changes your attitude about everything. As a parent, you know, knowing that the sacrifices you made have really helped your child fulfill their dreams and really have some amazing experiences as a 10-year-old child, I mean, those are gifts that she'll never, she'll never forget that kind of stuff. To see more Nebraska stories, go to our website and like us on Facebook. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund.